by the time the public square opened up, there would be no food, and so we'd have to cancel the, the program. So hang with us. Um, w this one starts at officially at 12 o'clock, and um, it's, it's, it'll be a little different than our previous public square. That, that pub the previous public square in the ballpark was the debate about who's for and who's against. You could, we, we, on that ballpark, we've had panel conversations, and also we had a debate. Um, and so we've used different formats, and, and uh, the audience just did a great job of um, recognizing the significance of, co of uh, working within that framework. This one's going to be a little looser. Um, uh, this one, you, we're going to encourage you to kind of get up and, you know, move around. Uh, you know, kitchens aren't places where people stand in one place. They move around. Restaurants are a place of movement. So it's okay to get up and get around. You're not going to be rude on this one. And uh, we'll have... Uh, Two of our uh, talented people who have been covering uh, the food and drink parts of the business, opening it up at uh, precisely noon. So that's what we're going to do. We'll have some fun, and uh, we'll see how far the food goes. You're welcome to stop at any of the neighborhood restaurants. It would be lovely to have you come in and eat. And uh, mention that you want the public square discount. And just see how it goes, because we haven't worked it out with them. <laughs> and if you, did, if you do get a discount, let us know, because... We'll just play, play it by ear there. I like the public square discount. We'll see how it goes. Maybe you might get an extra glass of water. Who knows? Um, what else? Any other staging? Okay. Yeah, there's still water in the back. A as you can see, we, uh, the public square has, has, has had a really good support team over, over the years. And here are the two co-chairs of the public square planning committee, Paige Mudd and Bob Rayner. Uh, they help me plan this, but they actually do all the heavy lifting. And then... If you saw the person moving the uh, table, that's Joan Cross, who's our building. She's the building's manager. She does an excellent job. It's the one reason why this building, which was renovated in the mid-'90s, still looks the way it does. Um, if you notice also, we added some decorations to the room. The photos are uh, giant uh, frames of, of folks in pu public square uh, positions, uh, most of them with mics. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that at the uh, last part of it, but we thought that being a special one, it really makes the public square. And if you notice, uh, Senator McEachin is really doing the right job personifying how close you have to have the mic near your lips, um, because if you're like me and talk with your hands, you can't hear. Thank you very much. Louis Lovio will be covering this story. Louis, the multi-talented Louis Lovio, what, you never know what he's covering. Uh, he won't tell you either. Um, it's a surprise, okay. Hope everybody's comfortable. The restrooms, if you go out and make a right, you've got to climb some stairs, so plan a couple extra minutes. Um, they're on the left side. The building that's walled off is our HR department. They like walls for their conversations. It's not because they're being rude. Um, the person who's at the front counter of HR is Alice Paul, who helped us with our Christmas Mother Program. This year we raised over $270,000 on the Christmas Mother Program. We're quite proud of that, and Alice had a great role in that as well. Um, We've invited um, some really good representation of the foodie market here, and, and I'll leave to the, uh, those of our talented journalists to introduce those. But they look like they're standing ready to go. You're either looking for, like you're ready for a race to r break out, or you're, you're really afraid of people rushing the table, aren't you? Okay. I think we've taken away all of the knives, so nobody will be injured. Um, this is a phenomena. This, this, this phenomenon showed up in our... Um, public square on the millennium generation that was based on a um, survey that was done by the Southeastern Institute of Research and its owner, John Martin, was in the back just momentarily. He would back at 4.30. So we've, this is sort of a repeat but with a different tangent. We've never, we've, we've never had food before at the public square. Um, the the closest, closest we've come was the cake at the, at the 25th anniversary that had icing on it. It was about three inch thick that, nope, that broke knives. It was so uh, it was so far. We, we, we did not go to that bakery again. So, But you, you've been, you, you uh, were one of our stars at the Lincoln. I feel like I should be your star at everything that I like, but I feel like I'm not. Thank you. Thank you very much. You, 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 yes, you can come at all times. Yes. <laughs> all right. Um, real quick, we're getting a few more people. How many were here for the ballpark and have stayed for the food? Be honest. Okay. Oh, you put your hand down. I caught you. Okay, that's all right. That's good. Stay all day. Hello, John. How are you? You know, the neat thing about the public square is you get to know people uh, uh, over time. And so um, 
those of you who don't know us, make sure that we get a chance to talk to you so we get to know who you are a little bit more. So sort of a, Richmond is a big region, but in some aspects is a small neighborhood of, of friends who look out for each other. So we're good. Matt, what time you have? 12.01, okay, all right. Well, this, as I said, is going to be a little looser. So let's, uh, let's get Public Square 2 underway. Um, and we've changed the slide. Why is RVA, how many people need a uh, lesson in what RVA is? I've got this one guy, every time I put RVA in my columns, he writes back, RVA, what that? Um, so, and I, 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 I'm, it's, I, I want to take him out to lunch, but I don't know whether to take him down to the city or take him out to like somewhere like, like Tappahannock. I mean, I'll go out to Tappahannock. Yeah. Okay, well, you, you know, it, it's also an and proposition. You can be RVA and Richmond, be RVA and Chester and Henrico, but you've got to work through it. Um, it fits better on a hat, though. RVA fits better on a hat. All right, let's get started. Uh, again, why is Richmond a foodie town? We have a hashtag that introduces this to uh, make sure that we're in touch with all the various social media. I've got two helpers here. One is uh, Carrie Pfeiffer, who is the editor of Richmond.com and, and probably the most recognized authority on restaurants um, and, and the covering of who's here, who's there. She's the master scooper of that, no pun intended, a food, a food, a food uh, joke there. Uh, master scooper on this, and she's going to walk us through the food part. And we've got Jacob Geiger, who is our director of work at Richmond, which is our uh, online version aimed at small businesses, which is another success story that's burgeoning here in the, in the, in the great RBA or Richmond region. Um, and so I'm going to let them walk through the introductions of our guests here who have been so kind to bring food. It's kind of odd for us where the guests bring the food. Don't you think the host should have brought the food? I don't know. The beer good guys. question, Bert. You oh, you're the beer guys. Okay. I don't know, but at my, at my house, at my house, when I cook, we pray after the meal. So uh, it's not really good. All right, Carrie, take it away. What do we got? To, what do we got on tap in this important topic? Yeah, okay. So we're going to talk about food in Richmond and where we are. First of all, you know, clearly Richmond has had restaurants for many, many years. Um, there's been exciting things happening on the Richmond dining scene for, for, you know, 20, 25 years, if not longer. But lately, it seems like everything has accelerated. Richmond has gone from a town with a handful of good restaurants to one with ones with dozens. Seems like every time we turn around, Richmond is in the national press or on national television shows, and it's because of our food scene. So we brought together some of the talent in Richmond that's kind of helping make, make and shape Richmond dining, helping propel us forward. And they're going to kind of talk about what, what they've seen in Richmond dining, what they're bringing to the scene, and kind of what we can expect next. Because really, it's only going to get better. That's just the food part, though. Jacob has the sorry, sorry task of covering beer for Richmond. Jacob, why don't you tell me where we are with beer? So two years ago, there were two breweries in Richmond, or about two and a half years ago. There was Legend Brewing Company, which is turning or turned 20 just a few months ago, and then there was Extra Billy's Brewing, which is a barbecue restaurant primarily and was just brewing on a minuscule, very small scale, didn't even have a full-time brewer. Today, there are nine breweries, and there are three more that should open during the first six months of 2014. So the, one of the big questions is, why are there suddenly so many breweries? Why has the craft beer industry taken off so well? And another big question is, why is this a good thing for a region to have, uh, instead of just a few craft breweries, a big cluster of them? And so we have brought together uh, two members of the craft brewing scene, Chris Ray from Center of the Universe, wave Chris, and Aaron Thackeray from Isaac Brewing Company. Uh, Center of the Universe opened in November of 2012, right, Chris? And uh, Isley opened in October of 2013. So both very young breweries, but already having some good success. And I think one of the interesting things is that when you get to a larger number of, whether it's breweries, whether it's software companies, whatever the, the business or industry, is you get lots of talented people in the same place. And that gives them the ability to move back and forth between businesses, it gives them the ability to go start their own business with the things they've learned. And I think we'll actually hear the same thing is true in the explosion of the dining scene. Many of these chefs uh, have trained with the same people or have worked together, and that gives them a um, 
a familiarity with each other and ability to collaborate with each other. And that's really helpful as you're trying to build something that you know, gets attention for an entire region. So those are the folks that we brought together. And I think what we're going to do is we're going to hear a little bit from each of the chefs and from the uh, brewers. And then we're going to let you all come up and eat the food because we don't want to make you stare at it for the whole hour because that would just be Martha horrible. All right, we'll let Martha go first. And so once we, like I say, we're going to first hear briefly from the chefs and the brewers, and then we're going to keep them close. And as you get the food, we're going to um, let everyone kind of head back to their seats, and then we'll be able to take, they'll be here to take your questions about the food scene, about the restaurant industry, about the beer industry, and what they see as trends for the next few months. And then towards the end, we'll really just totally break it up into informality and let you get up, as Saz says, move around and come up and meet them one-on-one. -on -one. I know they all want to get to know you. So... I'll turn it to you and let you introduce your chefs and uh, restaurant folks, and they can all tell us a little bit about what they brought and what they do. Yeah, chefs and owners are clearly shy little wallflowers. They're all over there in the corner. But I will bring these guys up and force them out of their shell. Uh, first up is Michelle Jones. She is the co-owner of Pasture Restaurant, which is right behind us on Gray Street. Then uh, her co-owner on Pasture, co-owner at Pasture, chef uh, Jason Alley, who also owns Comfort Restaurant on Broad Street and Owen Lane, chef owner of the Magpie in Carver District near VCU. Oh, we got a fan. So why don't you guys first start us off and tell us a little bit about the food that you brought. And if someone would, Joe Sparata, chef owner at Heritage, was supposed to be here. He's a sick baby. He did bring food. Um, so if somebody also, or I can do it, cover what, what uh, Joe left. Jason? I really don't know what Joe left, so okay, I'll do I'm it. not going to do that. Um, hey, I'm Jason. So like you said, we have comfort and we have pasture both downtown, um, and it's been awesome. We've had comfort for 11 years um, in Jackson Ward, and it's been rewarding every day. And pasture on Gray Street just keeps getting better. It's awesome to be in the neighborhood. Uh, when you come up, we brought ham rolls. So it's house-cured ham. We do a, a house-cured city ham in the restaurant that with local pork, uh, homemade bread and butter pickles, and pimento cheese on potato rolls. So It's delicious. <laughs> Hi, I'm Owen, uh, owner of Chef the Magpie. Uh, we'll be coming up on our third year anniversary this summer. Um, what I brought today, we have a country uh, rabbit pate with house pickle and some mustard. Um, this past couple years has just been absolutely incredible. Um, I'm sure we'll touch base on that a little bit more, but uh, hope you enjoy everything we brought. Uh, and I am also not going to touch on what Joe brought. Okay, I'll, I'll do it. That's Carrie. Joe, I apologize. Joe brought uh, pork fries that are served with barbecue sauce and house-made pickles from the Heritage Restaurant, Heritage, which is coming up on its, well, it's just over two years old, or just over a year old at this yeah, point. Um, but I'm curious, sort of, and you guys can kind of come up and, 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 and make some plates and, and help yourself um, now, if you'd like. But um, Yeah, make it informal. No, <laughs> but I'm also, but Tom brought up, brought up a good point about the sort of why the pimento cheese and it kind of made me realize, like, talk a little bit about your concept. Because kind of, Jason, you know, we, you, you know what, what Pasture and Comfort are doing are very different concepts than the Magpie. Um, and you kind of brought, with Comfort, kind of southern food back in a really strong way, kind of upscale southern to Richmond in an affordable way. Kind of talk about that concept and how you built on it and differentiated it with Pasture. Um, you know, like I said, we opened 11 years ago, 11 and a half years ago now. And uh, I moved here from Atlanta. <coughs> And, of course, Atlanta has a lot of really strong dining options, even then, even 12 years ago. Um, but when I was here, I realized that there wasn't a place to get delicious southern food at night. There were some great lunch places, Johnson's Grill downtown. I'm sure a lot of you guys remember that place. It was amazing. But if you wanted to go to supper and have southern food and maybe have a beer or a glass of wine or a cocktail, there just wasn't an option. Um, so it's dear and dear to my heart. I'm from southwestern Virginia. Um, I love the food. But it was really just a gap in the market. Um, which God knows that gap has been filled many times over now since then, which is awesome. So, um, yeah, you know, it's about celebrating Southern food and where we are in the region and just, you know, the amazing producers that are around us. And, you know, yeah, and I it. mean, it's still kind of nobody does it like comfort. You guys kind of brought it back, and you brought it back. And one of the things I'll touch on once everybody sits down is kind of what – no brush – but um, – kind of neighborhood dining and going into and revitalizing neighborhoods, because you guys certainly did it with comfort um, initially, coming into Gray Street two and a half years ago, um, and then with the Magpie and Carver as well. You want to talk about Grace, Michelle? Well, I mean, I think that Gray Street 
is such a beautiful place. Our partner, Rye Marchant, is over there, and he bought this beautiful building, which was Mentaldo's for so many years, and so many people have really fond memories of that. And so we were just excited to be able to be a part of this revitalization of the neighborhood. You know, I think it's kind of strange to think that, you know, there wasn't more going on with Center Stage there, a couple of hotels, you know, and I think people's perceptions were kind of that it was still sort of dangerous, but we see more and more people every day and it feels more and more like a real neighborhood where we see the same folks and the repeat guests and, you know, people are excited, you know. We have a patio, which I don't think people would have thought possible five years ago on that street. And we've had, I can't think of a single incident, <laughs> so that's pretty good, I think. Yeah, and again, it's a half a block from here. I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah. you know, it's just such a great kind of happening downtown scene. And what about Carver, Owen? Because you went into Carver. Um, there are, I think, two restaurants still in Carver. Is that right? You guys in the Black Sheep? If I want to describe, I want to describe where Carver is for those who don't know. Well, the Carver district is pretty much right behind the Siegel Center, um, kind of adjacent uh, to Jackson Ward on the other side of uh, Belvedere. Tell me you don't have a Havoc special every night. Definitely do not have a Havoc special okay, every good. night. Um, well, when uh, my wife and I, Tiff, um, she, she couldn't be here today. Uh, when we were looking for um, a restaurant, uh, our first venture of our own, um, you know, that's a very hard thing to do with a um, small fi financial backer. And um, what we found was the space. It was right. Uh, we wanted it to be small, uh, easy for us to manage, and, and be able to have fun in the kitchen and do the kind of stuff I love to do. And you know, coming off the heels of Jason, and Jason and I have been friends for almost 10 years, almost 10 years now, and um, I, grew, I grew up um, hunting and eating game, and I knew that that was uh, the route I wanted to go, um, rustic yet modern, um, wanted it to have kind of a nice pubby feel to it, um, you know, once you come in and sit down, we, did, we don't want you to leave, so that was kind of our vision on that, and I, I think if most of you, have, hopefully most of you have been there, uh, you feel the same way. And uh, just like Jason, using uh, all local purveyors, uh, farmers, anything, keeping trying to keep it within inside the Virginia borders was our mission statement. But uh, that's about where we stand there. So let's, let's keep talking about neighborhoods because Aaron Thackeray and Isley Brewing Company are in Scott's Edition, which if you're not familiar with it, is the neighborhood that is just west of the boulevard and just north of Broad Street. And it's kind of the northern boundary is sort of the uh, railroad tracks and the big CSX rail yard. It's an area of warehouses, uh, old brick warehouses, some apartment redevelopments happened in the area and is ongoing right now. It's now home to Isley, it's home to Lamplighter Coffee's new roasting operation, and later this spring it'll be home to one of those new breweries I mentioned, those Arden Craft Ales. So it's suddenly becoming a uh, place to drink both by the day with good coffee and by night with good beer. It's also just about a mile, mile and a half away from Hardywood and from the Redskins training camp and from the current location of the ballpark, but we're not going back into the ballpark, I promise. Jacob, Jacob, you're better than GPS, man. Okay. So, Aaron, Aaron, tell me a little bit about why you all were interested in Scott's Edition. And, and what I think is interesting about breweries is you all tend to be located in uh, more industrial-type neighborhoods that often are places people would not have gone to before. I, I, you know, I'd never really been in Scott's Edition before I first started going over to Lamplighter and Isley earlier this year. I came to Isley, I didn't know terribly much about uh, Scott's Edition in the area, uh, but apparently it's a very, very up and coming area in Richmond right now. Uh, I've been told that 15% of the overall uh, construction in Richmond is happening in the Scott's Edition area, which is pretty sweet. I mean, there's a, a lot of room for growth around there. I would imagine a lot of businesses are starting to look towards that area because of the lower rent um, and the, the possibility for reconstruction of a lot of places. Um, and it's been kind of nice for us to be at the ground floor of what's to come for Scott's Edition in the future. Um, as Jacob was saying, you know, we have Lamplighter Coffee, that's our neighbors. Uh, we have Richmond Bicycle Studio, which is, uh, the, they're doing a, a ton of business out of their place. And then, you know, there we are right on the same strip, uh, making beer, and right across the street is a local distillery uh, reservoir, which has been around for almost three years, uh, making small batch bourbon, rye whiskey, wheat whiskey. So. There's a lot of things happening in the area. It's great to be uh, on the ground floor of it all. And, you know, we're just going by the seat of our pants and, and seeing what happens with the area and how it develops. And hopefully more people will come out to the area and 
um, help us revitalize it. So, Chris, you all are out in Hanover County, just kind of on the, uh, in, in also sort of an industrial area. But what I think was interesting about you all was you were really one of the first breweries to open up outside of the city limits and to be out in the county. And uh, I think that presents a different sort of uh, challenge and opportunity. You have very different customers probably than, say, Hardywood or Isley might downtown. And, and just the way that a restaurant in Hanover County right. might have different customers than uh, Jason and Owen are serving day in and day out inside the city. So how did you all approach that? Why did you pick to be out in Hanover, and how does that change the way you all have uh, made your beer and sold your beer? Um, well, first, I've, I've lived in Ashland for about 10 years now, um, and so I kind of wanted to stay close to home. My whole thinking was if, if I can't have my business where I live, then I probably shouldn't be, uh, be living there. Um, another reason um, why we picked this spot is because uh, – we want to be more of a, a neighborhood brewery, um, so we we focused on a, a location that was um, heavily surrounded by neighborhoods. Um, we knew that the the loyalty from that type of demographic is going to be more sustainable, um, but we also realized how close we were to Richmond. Um, so we're literally you know 10 minutes from the Diamond, um, so it's really just a hop on the interstate. Um, we also positioned ourselves where if you come from Northern Virginia. Uh, we're the first brewery that you hit before you get into Richmond. So oftentimes we're the first one either on the way in or on the way out that people stop in. Um, and we also uh, knew that there was plans in place for uh, the outlet malls right over by Bass Pro Shop. Um, so we were able to position ourselves there as well. Um, it's just a really easy in and easy out access uh, right off of 95 um, with the close proximity to still be in the, I guess, uh, greater Richmond area. And I'm curious to know sort of, you know, from the restaurant perspective, as kind of craft beer has exploded, um, I know I'm, it seems to me as a diner that you guys are adding more and more local taps. Are you seeing that, is that affecting kind of how you're looking at food or food pairings or just kind of what you're seeing from diners? Well, I think, go ahead, you're on. Go ahead. Um, I think it was a really ex exciting thing when it all started to to happen because that was one thing that we didn't have and once the brewery started to pop up you know there was you know within the Virginia borders I mean God knows how many breweries there are now but um, you know everyone in, in Richmond is just as excited about it as we are so whenever we put on a new tap or we talk about you know somebody's getting ready to release this new beer th this week and it's coming out tonight you know people flood the restaurants and they're they're just as excited about it as we are which i think is a really really big point to make that it's not just us now that are excited about everything happening it's it's all of you as well so you know at our restaurants we've always had a focus on craft beer um just because it makes sense you know it's something that, that we like to drink it's delicious but the big difference is that now you know it's less of that that we're focused more on craft beer since it's exploded, but what it does is allow us to purchase beer the way that we purchase pigs or the way that we purchase tomatoes, which is to be able to keep those dollars inside the community. Um, and luckily, all these breweries are really delicious um, because local is really important, but for us, delicious is j uh, you know at least as, if not more. So these guys doing the job they're doing makes our jobs uh, a whole lot easier. Is it really good that craft beer explodes? Hardywood could tell you it's not because they had an explosion that lost uh, almost all of their bourbon. Oops, sorry, that was really track the question. Yeah, that was too soon, too soon for us uh, as we mourn the loss of their beer. And we had a little bit of a, of a late arrival, but it's all good because he brought some delicious pizza from his restaurant. This is Dirk Graham, the owner of Bottoms Up Pizza in Shaco Bottom. Hey, right. Dirk. Which, Dirk, do you want to talk a little bit about, you've been in, your restaurant's been open for more than 20 years. Is that, is that right, in Shaco Bottom? 22 to be. 22. I feel like you've survived maybe a little. Did you guys have like a flood damage at some point? A little bit of that? When the Gaston came through, um, we had 10 feet of water inside the restaurant. And it, and, and um, it took us a year to come back. So we were fortunate that after that, that you know, it, it was slow at first, but over time business has picked up. But uh, we're, we're still, you know. I'm more concerned about this healthcare mandate than I was a flood, but how that's going to impact us. But overall, you know, I, I've got no complaints. I mean, things can be better. This year in particular has been off a little bit, but January, February are just are typical months. And then, uh, so with with 
two decades in the business, kind of how have you seen has craft beer kind of been something that you've embraced? Have you seen a demand from that in customers? Have you guys? Yes, we have. We were just I was talking to my general manager the other day about bringing in different, more different craft beers, and we've got a wide selection on the menu. What and hey, Carrie, I'm a little worried. Word has gotten out in the building that there's free food. Here's Todd Culberson from the editorial department down here, freeloading. Oh no, <laughs> reporters and free food. It's a it's it's a thing. So you guys get up and get seconds fast because it's going to be gone quickly. What so and Jason, you were talking a little bit about kind of how you source pigs and stuff. Are you what? How has local sourcing changed in Richmond to you to Owen to to all of you guys um, in terms of sourcing local ingredients, kind of working with farms and farmers? Uh, I mean, it's wildly different than it was ten years ago. That's for sure. Um, you know, it's not that people haven't been farming in in Virginia forever. I mean, it's a, it's the mainstay of our economy, but. You know, it was a lot of big agriculture, and, and that makes sense. Uh, but what we're finding now is these small farms that really couldn't supply even one restaurant consistently with product, that um, the demand is increased enough that they can increase their production. So, you know, I've got three different people that I can source pigs from. I've got plenty of people that we can source meat from. And then a lot of the farmers, vegetable farmers, one of the things that's most exciting for us, like Victory Farms, we work with a ton. Um, and they're really excited to plant specifically for us. There are things that we want to see on the menu. There are different types of pole beans, for example, that we want to be able to sell at Comfort. Nobody's been growing them. They're going to grow them for us this year. So that's been really exciting. And just the product that we can get from beer to cheese to meat, I mean, it's just incredible the difference now than it was even five years ago, but certainly 10. And what, Owen, what are you, and you kind of using, you know, a lot of game and stuff. How are you kind of sourcing that? Have you seen it? Is it more readily available? Are you shooting it in your yard? Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Just like Jason said, uh, I mean, even five years ago, it's uh, even three years ago, it's changed dramatically from, you know, we use Victory Farms as well. They'll, they'll grow anything we want. Um, I, I even have friends that have uh, an extra plot that they actually, or we sat down and ordered seeds just for the magpie this coming year, and my friends are growing it for me, which is awesome. But the farms, the, I mean, rabbit, I mean, uh, you can get everything, and it's and it's such a dramatic change that, you know, just like Jason said, it's it's all right here and it's all at our at our fingertips now, and just that that big change in in, in five years has has changed everything for everybody, and it's so exciting to have these farmers come in and want to sit down, want to order stuff for you, want you to come out to the farm and take a walk through the farm. Um, does the local sourcing apply to, to the beer stuff as well? Or are you guys kind of growing that locally? Where I don't, how do you even grow a hop? Where does that come from? Um, you can you can grow hops. Uh, the, the required amount of hops for a for a batch of beer is is pretty large. Uh, so you have to have kind of a you can't be a part time hop farmer. Um, I know Licking Hole Creek uh, is doing uh, one batch of beer a year, and they've got uh, I don't know 10, 15 acres of hops. So most of the hops that we um, receive are from the Pacific Northwest. Um, Virginia used to be a hot spot to grow hops way back in the day. Um, hops usually do well in areas that you can grow uh, grapes for wine, so hopefully we'll see some of that. Uh, one thing that, I, that we really want to see is uh, a malt house in Virginia. Um, currently there are no malting houses in Virginia, so we cannot source any grain because um, grain doesn't just come from the field and then we use it in production. It actually goes through a, a malting process that has to be done at a very large facility and uh, unfortunately in Virginia there isn't one. One of the questions I had both for the chefs and the brewery owners is around kind of collaboration inside your industry. You know, Carrie mentioned in her article in Sunday's paper that there were some recent dinners that where several chefs from a restaurant will come together to cook for a certain cause or for the James Beard Foundation. Breweries also um, sometimes work together to collaborate on beers, but what, what I've also noticed is interesting is you all collaborate and share equipment sometimes, buy equipment from each other as one brewery outgrows, you know, say a fermenting tank. They'll sell it, you know, at a used price to a, a smaller, newer brewery. Um, Chris, I remember you telling me in one of your early batches of beer, you all ran out of an ingredient and called Legend over and said, you know, we need this ingredient by the end of the day, and they just loaned you a bit until your next shipment came in. Um, how does that impact the ability, A, to, to make your own product better, but B, to market beer? You know, because you're not just marketing Center of the Universe's beer or Isley's beer. You're marketing Richmond beer or Central Virginia's beer. How does collaboration kind of play into that? And do you all deliberately seek that out or does it just happen naturally because you know each other? Um, so one of the reasons why um, I joined in this industry is, is kind of that collaborating 
effort. Um, it's, a, it's a strength in numbers game. Uh, craft beer right now um, has about 8 to 10 percent market share for total beer consumed in America. Um, so really it's, it's do we go after each other and fight over that 8 to 10 percent or do we join together and try to capture some of that 90 percent market share? And, and that's why you see the breweries working with each other, talking with each other. Uh, if we run out of an ingredient or if someone needs to borrow a, a sanitizer, you know, it's, it's a phone call away and, and you go and you get it. Um, it it's something that's, that's vital to, to the smaller brewing side uh, like us um, that you don't see in a lot of other industries. You know, if there's a c competing industry and, and one of them calls the other one and asks for, you know, a piece of equipment, the other guy kind of laughs at him and, and says, good luck. Um, but in the brewing industry, that's, that's not how it is. It's, it's, it's raising awareness of craft beer. And, and whether you're out at a restaurant drinking our beer or another beer, as long as it's local, that's what we're kind of looking for, just, just grow that market share. And, and I can, you can kind of see that with, with the restaurants. You know, this explosion of craft beer doesn't exist unless you have the restaurants that take it in. And they can exist without us, but we definitely can't exist without them. And so, you know, the collaboration not only exists between uh, the brewers, but we also do things with restaurants where we do tap takeovers and, and, and pins where different ingredients are put in. And, and I think that that's what we're looking for is, is the growth of a, of a craft brand instead of an individual brewery. And I mean, I've definitely, oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I was just going to touch note about that. Um, talking about uh, how breweries have been collaborating with each other, uh, I think a lot of credit can go to our distributor, uh, Brown Distributing, kind of created this brand of Steven, Taste the Local. Wave, Steven. And we it's got uh, Steven from Brown here in the Steven back. Steven over there. Wave. Uh, Brown's done a really, really great job of kind of rebranding Richmond breweries under this Taste the Local brand. And it's you know, as Chris was saying, it's not really us against each other. It's kind of us against the national brands, but really working together to better Richmond through better beers and collaborations with each other. Um, I can definitely second that, you know, we've only been open for three months, but we're the newest, we're the smallest guys, but we've been welcomed with open arms by every other brewery around town saying, you know, if you're ever out of ingredients, you know, please feel free to call, or if you need, you know, a small piece of equipment, you know, please give us a buzz. So it's really nice to um, have been extended the the welcome hand by everybody else, even though we're we're significantly smaller. Um, it's just really great to see how um, the breweries are coming together uh, with each other to bring more awareness to Richmond and kind of bring bring more attention to the city. It's a great thing. So, admit it. Who's going to turn down a brewery? <laughs> hey, hey uh, can I help you? Yeah, <laughs> light bulb. Boy, this is going to be fun for the celebration. All right, so right. just teasing. So, and I know Michelle, you've been you've been in the business. You know, obviously for you've been a pastor specifically, but you you were a front of the house person in a lot of different restaurants around with Richmond. Kind of, how have you seen the kind of like taste the local in restaurants? Are you are you? Is it seem like more people are embracing local restaurants? Uh, I mean, absolutely. No. No. Anyone ever asked me where anything was from, except maybe where was their beer coming from the bar, not fast enough. Um, but, you know, and so now, and I always felt like, you know, we tried to give good service. Sometimes it was grumpy service. But, you know, it was never about, it was always about just the experience and not about the food specifically. It was good chili, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, nobody cared where it came from. And now, not just our servers care. You know, everyone cares, and you know it used to be that the chef would tell you the special, and the servers would like sort of look over to the side and not be interested. And now I have servers who are asking us, you know, where did this come from? You know, what? You know, why do we have this? This kind of thing. And so I think we're just getting a different level of diner, a different level of front of the house person, and yeah, I mean, I think it's it's all coming together. And I feel like for us, what we try to do every day is. When we say the best of Virginia, it doesn't just mean the food or the beer. It also means the service and the entire experience. So, Because, you know, if you get a restaurant review in there and you have great food and terrible service, that marks you down. It's, it's somewhat suggested that, you know, things grow faster than other things. Is the service catching up with the quality of food? I mean, that's an interesting perspective. I mean, I really, I try every day. Um, as I say, some days we even succeed. <laughs> but I really <laughs> believe that, I yes, that people care and the servers care. And because the restaurant industry in Richmond 
is now a place with all this local, very interesting things, chefs doing interesting things. You're getting people who no longer just view it as, I can pick up a couple of shifts while I work my way through school. They understand that being a server, being good at their job is a career move, you know, that you can move up. I, I mean, I'm living proof. So uh, I've worked every position in the restaurant except for cook. I always say that because no one would want to eat my cooking, but I've washed dishes. I still bust tables, you know, and so these waitresses now can, you know, think about owning their restaurant, own restaurant in five, ten years, hopefully. Do you see, but I, I, Jason, I recall you said at some point on, on some panel that it is that we do have, Richmond does have some growing pain sometimes in terms of staffing. I think you were speaking specifically of the back of the house, kind of kitchen staff, because there are so many great restaurants in Richmond now that we don't necessarily have enough bodies to di wash dishes and, 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 you know, run the line or do or work on the line. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, you know, staffing, no matter what your business is, I mean, that's one of the more challenging things is staffing, training, um, having people embrace your brand and whatever your aesthetic is. Mm -hmm. So it is challenging. And as these restaurants explode, you know, so subsequently do the amount of people needed to perform the task. The only thing that I think that's really good happening right now is that as we do get some more juice nationally and as we do have people moving to town, that when cooks are graduating culinary school or when they're kind of sick of the rat race of a bigger city, they are looking to Richmond to move. Excellent. You know, and we're finding that with service staff, with bartenders, that, you know, we're becoming a desirable place to live more and more every day and a more desirable place to work. How does the national attention affect that in terms of bringing talent to Richmond? I mean, I think it's really important. I mean, I wouldn't work my ass off every single day to get it if I didn't think that it was important. Um, you know, it's the, it's, when you're a young cook and you're looking through Bon Appetit and you see Richmond restaurants, you're like, oh, well, maybe I could work there. And when you start to see that consistently and you're looking to get out of New York, Good you're looking to get out of, you know, San Francisco where you're jammed in a house with, you know, six other guys, you start to think about those smaller cities, those smaller markets that still have something to, to offer. So without that national attention, there's no reason for those people to think of us. So I, I do think it's important. And obviously, Richmond got some pretty dawning news yesterday with uh, the announcement that Top Chef's Mike Isabella is opening a restaurant in Richmond. He's looking at expanding. He could have expanded to New York. He could have expanded to Charleston. He could have expanded to Atlanta. He's expanding into Richmond. What I would imagine that craft brewing is pretty trendy. Is that, do people want to work there? Do you guys have the same staffing challenges? I know people that want to work there. Fringe benefits. Send, send them over to the kitchens. Do we have some questions? Yeah, I think Jacob's getting ready to do some questions. Is that right? Yes. Uh, we're going to turn it over for questions. But I first had a question for Dirk. And I think what's interesting is uh, Jason is an, and Comfort are about 10 years old. But almost everyone up on the stage has is, is been in their current role for or in their current restaurant or brewery less than three years. So 22 years. One thing that's interesting, I think, you know, you need sustainability. So how have you managed to keep your customers coming in 22 years? Is it a mix of service? Is it changing things? Is it keeping things the same? What do you do to make sure you preserve, you know, turn customers into long-term customers? It's something Comfort's done, but um, I, I thought it'd be interesting to hear from you as well after 20-plus years. Overall, it's just trying to be consistent with the quality of your food so you're not getting your pizzas, you know, taste good one day and the next it's it's different i mean that's always uh, we don't always get it right but we strive to do that if we make mistakes we, we we take care of them you know the customer is comes always right and comes first um you know as as the years have gone by lately we we've, we've we've actually hired a uh, a manager that that goes out and dr and looks for looks for business to try to part with parties we have a, a substantial number of seats upstairs so we try to uh, she's actively searching for p groups that want to have a hold events down at the restaurant, and it just I said a lot of it is, is just the you know the pizzas. People say, oh, it's New York style pizza. It's it's not. It's, it's just different pizza. It's not any particular pizza. And then we've got the unique setting of the, the our deck, our outside decks, the flood wall, and the trains that come by. You know, and it, you just can't duplicate that anywhere else. And I think that, along with, with having quality food, is what made us successful over the past 22 years. All right, we are going to open it up to questions. I saw a question in this row, didn't I? And then uh, I'll circulate around, and we'll make sure we can get as many from the chefs and the brewery owners as we can. Um, is this on? It is. <laughs> um, are you all afraid? Uh, there are really a lot of great restaurants in Richmond. 
Are you afraid of or see a danger of a glut in the restaurant business? Yeah, of course, every day. <laughs> I mean, it would be disingenuous to say that that stuff doesn't make us nervous, but at the, at the end of the day, you know, more and better really is more and better. You know, if, um, if we have these people coming in who are really top-notch cooks or great operators, it makes us really re-examine what we do, and it causes everybody to lift their game a little bit. Because um, if you have to compete with Owen, you kind of have to have your act together. So, you know, but there is always, you know, there's, there's a finite pie that we're all trying to get a piece of. So it is a little worrisome sometimes, but I, I think that the dining culture, and as the city grows and more people are moving into the city, I think that there's still room for quite a bit more. Uh, we got a question. Oh, Owen, do you want to say something about that? Um, the other thing that has happened uh, over the last few years is all of us have come together and, and realized that if we don't work together, if some, if Jason's getting great press and uh, Bon Appetit or I'm getting press in something, it's, it's not just for us. It's for the city. It's good for everything. So someone getting press here, someone getting press here, and us doing these dinners that we're getting press on, it's, it's all about the greater good. We got a question back here. Mine was more about, uh, I'm, I'm Marianne and I live in the county. Um, mine's more about uh, how did this happen to Richmond? It's wonderful. Um, it used to be that um, I guess uh, people would get tired of cooking and they'd just go out to eat to something nearby. Maybe some, there were a lot of chain restaurants. And now, um, did it happen with um, maybe uh, businesses moving in from like when Altria moved in here and some of the other larger businesses moved into the Richmond region and then that brought more um, customers that were used to a different type of um, eating. It seems now that not just people are just going out to eat because they're tired of cooking, they're going out to eat because that is what they want to do. They're focused on the food and the service and um, it is the end in itself and not, you know, just you know, a mom who's tired of cooking. <laughs> That's going out to eat for an experience. I think that, you know, for us, part of it is the growing food culture just nationally and everywhere. These, you know, food, there's so many food shows. My nephew is 14, and I think he knows more about food than I do because he watches all of them. And so he's, you know, he's interested in what we're doing in food, and everyone's interested. And so it gives us a more... Uh, you know, the diners know more, and they're interested. And I think they're seeing food, as like you're saying, more as actually entertainment as opposed to just grabbing something before a movie. All right, who else? Oh, oh wait, Jason. Has I just wanted to say that also having those new businesses move in has been a big impact on us, you know, because they're, it's not that the Richmond dining scene has been particularly unsavvy. It's just it hasn't been quite as dense, you know, for the, for the diners who are actually going to the restaurants. So the influx of, you know, Midwest Vaco coming back into town and that stuff, people moving here from New York, it does sort of raise the level of what's expected. And I think that's good for all of us to keep us all challenged. Absolutely. Yeah. We got one over here, then we'll go over there. Oh. Yes. Oh. Are those in the uh, breweries, uh, how are these growlers working out? Are they really adding they a big deal? Can you explain what a growler is, and then, uh, yeah, what sort? How is how have growlers changed your uh, the way you can do business? Um, sure, a growler is essentially a 32 or 64 ounce glass container that's refillable. Uh, you can purchase them from the breweries uh, and get beers to go. That uh, most of the time they don't package, so you can't get them in cans or bottles, and you can take them with you. I think the bigger picture, not that the growler isn't important, but it it, it was the bill that was passed SB 604. Um, in July of 2012 that allowed breweries to serve for on-premise without having a kitchen. Um, that allowed for um, an extra revenue stream. Uh, it also allowed for more one-on-one -on -one interaction with customers when they're, when they're drinking their beer. Before the law only allowed two two-ounce samples, and most breweries that you go to are going to have eight different beers on draft, and having to guess which one they might like for two free samples um, was tough. And you know, in an industry where it's an economy of scale, being able to have an extra revenue stream besides just your distribution really helps out, um, especially in the beginning stages. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just say with us uh, being the smaller guys, uh, growlers are incredibly beneficial for us because we don't have any package on the market. Um, I don't foreseeably see us uh, bottling any beer for some time. 
Um, so for now, growlers are really the only way for us to, outside of going to a restaurant, for you to be able to try the beer outside of our establishment. Um, it's great advertisement. People bring them to parties. You know, you've got this giant Isley growler, and oh, what's that? You know, here's a, a blueberry version of our Belgian white, and word spreads very quickly. So I think growlers have been a, a huge part of our growth in the first three months that we've been around. How long does a growler last? If you buy it, when do you have to drink it by? Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, because uh, I hear variations on this all the time. Um, <laughs> it depends on the type of growler you have. Most screw top growlers, I would say, if left unopened and refrigerated, are usually good for about a week before they're going to start losing a little bit of carbonation each day. Um, but once you open a growler, you've got about a two-day two window to drink it. I, I always tell people, think of it like a two-liter of Coke, um, how many times you open that two-liter and you drink it. And kind of by that second or third day, you get down to the bottom third. It's a little flat. It doesn't taste terribly good. Um, also depends on the beer, too. Some, some beers hold up better than others, but the general rule of thumb is about two days after you open a growler. Is that about right? Or this gentleman, just an hour and a half, two hours, by the end of the night, right? I don't have a question. My name is Irina Fazeldin. I don't have a question, but a, a, a statement. I just want to say thank you, thank you so much for what you do. Your effort is very important in revitalization of Richmond. For you to come to Scott Edition, to come to Carver, and to go to downtown Grace, this uh, area needs to be revitalized, a new community. But you coming out there, you help in revitalization of Richmond. All I want to say is thank you. I try my best to come out and eat in each and various restaurants, but I haven't been to I love beer, so I, I'm going to come to Scott Edition. Hanover is too far, but for <laughs> beer, I will come. <laughs> and I just want to say sir, thank you, and I've been to Bottoms Up Pizza for a long time since I've been to Richmond. Thank you for what you do. And thank, th you. and thank you to everybody. We wouldn't, <laughs> we wouldn't be as successful if it wasn't for all of you. So it's, it's dual-sided. Thank you very much to you guys as well for making us successful. <laughs> Go ahead. I just wanted to say um, thank you guys so much. Yeah, Comfort's awesome, and Dirk, uh, bottoms up. I've been eating. I've been in Richmond all my life, and um, I, I wanted to ask a question. I always heard this when I was young. I, I heard that chain restaurants used to send their restaurants to Richmond because they said if a restaurant could survive in Richmond, it could survive anywhere. And um, I, I was always told that as a, as a kid and so forth because I used to always ask, well, why isn't this restaurant here? Why isn't that restaurant here? And I was always told that they sent restaurants to Richmond. They said they could survive here. They could survive anywhere. And Dirt, keep up the, the good work, man. That's, that's awesome stuff. I can certainly speak to that. That is not true. Uh, <laughs> we opened a comfort in Portsmouth a few years ago, and, yeah, it didn't fly. But maybe Portsmouth isn't the best example of a city to open in. So comfort's been fine here, but it didn't work. But, you know, I know that it's a big test market for a lot of places, a lot of chain places, like when they're doing rollouts and stuff. They do test here, and I think a lot of it's also the diversity in the marketplace. So there's a lot of different people. So you get a good cross-section here that you may not get in, in Indianapolis, for example, or another city that's about the same size. So, you know, I think that that's a lot to do with it, too, is that it's a fairly adventurous town, and it's, it's pretty diverse, and it's, you know, in all of the demographics. All right. Several, several of the counties had um, mill tax on their ballot recently, and part of the justification for that was that so many people come from outside of the counties to um, eat there. So I want to encourage everyone in here to remember to eat in Richmond City in these areas that need revitalization, and I've eaten at every one of these restaurants, and they're just fantastic. So I, I have, my question is two, twofold. How has the meal tax in the city of Richmond impacted the restaurants that are in the city? And secondly, do we have any idea in the city how many people come from the counties or from outside of the city to eat in our restaurants here? I just want to preface that really quickly and say that before we started, Owen Lane said, do not let me go off on the meals tax. That is all I want to talk about. So, Owen. So, Owen. <laughs> we have a lot of people that come from surrounding areas to the Magpie. We have so many West Enders that come. Um, with the meals tax, um, I believe that it's incredibly too high and absolutely needs to be lowered. 
um, because we have a lot of um, business uh, men and women that come into the restaurant when they're staying in the all the hotels that are right around both of our restaurants. And uh, when they get the bill, the first thing they get say is 11.3, and they're outraged. And comparatively in the counties, it's... it's co counties, other, other cities, I mean, it's... It's 6% in the counties. It's what's it in, in New York, you were telling me? 8.8 .8 in New York City. So... Do you see that? Do you, do you think that deters people from dining in, the, in, in restaurants, or does it deter... Is it uh, well, in the last couple of years, I don't, I don't think it's deterred people, but it, it always comes up in conversation, and then it goes away, and then it comes back up. But I think it's something that we should really focus on, and you know, if we can get that down, that just means better things for all of us. I mean, more people will want to go out and eat. You know, a little place like me, with 11 uh, and 0.3, when my taxes come around and I have to drop and I just wrote a big check for that. I mean, it's it hurts. And, you know, Richmond has always been a small individual uh, community of retail and restaurants. And if you want to keep that, you need to you need to lower that because it, it helps it helps out the little guy. So. As far as people who are coming from the surrounding areas, um, we see a lot of that. You know, we see a lot of business travel and we do see a lot of people from the counties. Um, the one thing I'll say about the, the meals tax, and I don't want to get too far into it, is um, whether or not it deters people, like I was saying, it does sometimes leave a bad taste in people's mouths, you know, so it does detract from that, that overall experience. So they've had this wonderful experience, they get the check, and they're like, oh my God, that's a little crazy. So, you know, that's, the, that's sort of our, our, our city's parting gift to our diners is 11.3% tax on their, their meals. So. <laughs> yeah. It's on. Yeah, just hold the chain off. Talk. Hello. It's I on. Grew up, I grew up. I love. Is it working? Yep. yep. Can't tell. I grew up going to Millen Rhodes, Tall Iris, and Montaldo's. I love, love, love. We love. We live in Midlothian. We love coming down there to eat. We've been addicted to Bob's Up Pizza for years. When we walk into uh, Pasture, that darling girl at the bar from Ashland recognizes us, says hello. Everyone is so, so friendly. We've eaten at all the places. Last week we went to Max's for drinks, went to Beast 327 for dinner. We're going to bring some friends and go to Pasture in Rappahannock. We love it. And it may be a higher meal tax, but, honey, you can't get anything that tastes that good at where our meal tax is. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to that. And just to say that we're, when we opened up in the Montado's building, we were a little worried about what people who had been to Montado's before would think because it's very different. And we had uh, Carol, who was the past, the last president of Mentaldo's come in. And she's just the most gracious, wonderful person. And I said, Carol, you know, it's a little, you know, I know this is kind of weird for you, but what do you think? And she said, it's beautiful. I think I never look back. I always look forward. And that's what we try to, you know, to do as well. And so, and I'm so glad to hear that people have been friendly. They better. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a couple questions from the back of the room. Anyone in the front of the room have a question or a comment? All right, I guess we'll stay in the back of the room then. I'll come back to Aaron. Don't worry. <laughs> I really love to support the, the new restaurants. There are so many of them. But also I see so many of them that start and try so hard but are not successful and they go out of the business. So there's two questions. I wonder what is the success rate for new start restaurants and what would – your advice be for someone that's starting a new restaurant in Richmond? I think they say the statistic is what, eight and ten restaurants fail in their first year. I think that's the statistic. I would just say my only advice, and I'm going to pass it to the chefs and stuff, but the restaurant business is a really hard business. You have to have a thick skin. You have to come out every day and have a vision, and you just have to decide you're going to do it. I mean, and, and you have to love it because it's not about the money. I have to say that, um, like I said, we've been, Bottoms Up has been in business for 22 years, but probably six, seven years ago, uh, I sold the franchise rights to an individual to duplicate Bottoms Up Pizza, and he opened up two late locations, and actually his first day opening was the day after we got flooded at Bottoms, uh, at Bottoms Up, so I was sitting here looking at the ruins of a restaurant, and it was probably not a month later until I got down there to see how he was doing. And he was doing 
everything totally different. And I guess what I'm trying to say is it, it, it's got to be a hands-on deal. The owner, operator, I mean, you've got to get in there and work it yourself. Th this guy did something else for a living. He just hired managers that, you know, that we trained them, but we're not down there watching. They, they don't have, you know, a piece of it themselves or, or whatever, but it, it, it's, it's got to really be a, a you got to, if you're going to own, own it, you got to work in it each and every day. And that's what made us successful. I can tell you the first year or two, I'm, you know, running to the bank to try to cover a check, running to the bank to try to cover a check. And, you know, over time we were lucky enough that things picked up where you know, we didn't have to do that anymore. But, uh, yeah, for, for to, to be successful, you need to be in there hands-on each and every day. Uh, I think another really big part of it is making sure you're staffing. Uh, I'm so fortunate, I'm sure – Jason and Michelle are exactly the same way. The people that work for you have to love it just as much as you do. And if they don't, you know, they, they got to go. <laughs> but, um, you know, like having a staff that is, I mean, it's, it's, so, it's so rewarding. And I think also with Richmond, you know, when we opened, you know, I've been in Richmond for 10 years, cooking in Richmond for 10 years and other cities as well. But I looked around and, okay, what, what, what aren't people doing right now? Okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make sure I'm going to do something completely different and try to have m my own little section of Richmond. And it uh, seems to be working out. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think uh, staffing, uh, and like Dirk said, it's, it's a hands-on business. You, I'm leaving for four days tomorrow, and I am nervous. Uh, to leave it in the hands of my staff, but on the other side of that, I'm I'm going to be okay with it because it's to the point where it's running like a machine. Um, I can trust them, uh, and I, I'm still nervous. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, just to touch on the, uh, the the rate of success, you know, you hear that you know eight out of ten close within the first year. It's a slightly inflated stat because it inc it includes so many different types of food establishments. Uh, you know, the success rate for an independent owned restaurant that's well capitalized, that's well structured, that's placed in the market in an appropriate way, is the success rate's a lot higher than that. It still is super challenging. Um, and subsequently, my, my, my advice for somebody who wants to open their own restaurant is don't, um, <laughs> unless you really, really, really love it. Um, it's the hobby restaurants that really fail. Um, Chef-driven, management-driven, you know, the restaurants that are open by people who believe in a concept, who create a concept and work it. And, you know, we have three restaurants now. So I'm not in every restaurant every day, but I'm in one of them or two of them every day. So you can do it with expansion. You don't necessarily, I don't have to go in there and cure the bacon every single day as long as I have good staff. But if you don't love it, it's a really, it can be a really tough thing. And that's where the failure rate, I think, starts to escalate pretty quick. Chris and Aaron, can you weigh in and tell us, for people, you know, obviously if we've gone from two breweries to nine in just over two years and we're adding three more, a lot of people are interested in opening a brewery. Uh, are there things that you got, good advice you got when you were getting ready to open or good advice you would give to the next wave of brewers opening if they want to make sure they are uh, successful in the long term? You gotta, um, ask, you gotta ask Chris the question, what's the difference between being a pro baseball oh, pitcher? Oh, everyone asks that. Well, okay, I haven't had a chance. First, he can answer my question first because I asked mine first. No, I'm in charge. How <laughs> uh, no, it works. And all you said at the restaurant, it's no different in newspapers. <laughs> I, I, we heard you. But uh, what's it? I mean, you've you've got a second career. What's the difference between being an individual who can excel and now pitching a business? Um. Well, it's completely different, uh, except for for a few things. Um. One, uh, in, you know, in the baseball industry, you're driven to improve every day you have to um, you're gonna get you're gonna get passed by and I think especially in the manufacturing industry the restaurant industry uh, you can't just be content with where you are um, you have to keep pushing forward um, and again you're you're being judged on your product uh, like I was judging my performance um, you know people taste it you got to have thick skin some people aren't gonna like the way you play some people aren't gonna like your beer um, but as long as you have a big enough group that that love your beer uh, then you're fine um, as far as uh, opening a brewery, we, uh, I get emails um, almost every other week, uh, folks wanting to, to 
hey, can I come in and check out your brewery and talk to you about how to open up a brewery? And I'm, you know, what, what people don't know is that we worked in the industry for about two years before we opened up. Um, we started as a, as a, as a charitable um, organization that did a, that did a brew. And um, even though we worked in it, we home brewed for five years, we still hired a brewer that had six years experience brewing. Um, so I say if you're going to open up a brewery, work in the industry first. Because um, even still with us working in the charity, um, our head brewer, Mike, being a professional brewer for six years, we're still learning stuff. We're still taking our lumps. Um, and I, I couldn't imagine just going from five gallons to 465 at a time without any kind of, you know, knowledge of what I was doing. It would be, uh, it would be tough. Uh, yeah, I'd have to agree. Um, the, in the, the beer industry, the craft beer industry specifically, um, you got to love what you do. And you really got to take some practice with it. Um, I'm not the owner. I'm just the brewery manager. So I'm sure my owner would have <laughs> better advice to give for opening a brewery. But um, definitely from a, a beer making side, the brewmaster and I were longtime friends and home brewers together. Uh, we worked on a number of recipes uh, the last couple of years and got a feel for it, you know, got, got our feet wet with it. And I think there are a lot of folks that drink craft beer and love it. And just because you like it doesn't necessarily mean you can make it. Um, it is it's not that easy. Yeah, you got to put some time and some effort into it. But so long as you have good preparation and um, God willing, if you have the capital, invest as much as you can in the biggest equipment you can. Because uh, we're, as a small brewery already, we're we're quickly getting to that point where we're going to have to start thinking about uh, reinvesting in bigger equipment. So um, my advice, I guess, would be for an up and coming brewery to if you got the capital, spend it because um, it'll eventually come back to you. At, at this point, it looks like the number of questions we have exceed the amount of time. So I'm going to let the Carrie say any final thoughts, and then we'll give the last word to our chefs and brewers. And then they are going to stick around for a few minutes at the front of the room. So you all who still have questions, please do come up. And um, do you want to say anything, Cavs? Before just we don't burp in their face. That's right, a, yeah, just, that'd be yeah. rude. Um, and, I, and I'll, I'll say, what, here's, here's Michael Phillips. He's fresh back from the Super Bowl. He's our Michael Phillips over here. Michael Phillips, what do you think? Should we have a Russell Wilson, Michael Robinson day in Richmond? Wait, Should we have a dish? Russell Wilson, dish? Michael Robinson yeah. beer? Dish, yeah. What would be a Russell Wilson, Michael Robinson dish? Well, Michael Robinson's a big guy, so it'd be like a, a big hamburger, like yeah. a half pounder kind of thing. Should I be pitching this to these guys? Uh, I, I think he, I think <laughs> the comfort meatloaf could hit, should should hit him. A ni nice, yeah. yeah, I like that. Okay. So, I mean, I think thanks, thank you everybody for coming. I'll let the chefs have the the last word, but I think kind of. I'll try to use a sports analogy, even though I don't know anything about sports, but I think that's a theme. And Just go for it, Gary. But yeah, I mean, I think what I'm seeing more than anything from the beer, what's changed in Richmond Dining is that it's now in the hands of the pros. For years, there were a handful of pros, and there was a lot of minor league, minor league players or football, whatever they are. But it is <laughs> the people who are running restaurants are people Pick who the restaurants. have experience in restaurants. It's not for years it was people who were opening restaurants, I would – go and interview them. I've been covering it for 10 years. And they would say, I would say, why are you opening a restaurant? And they said, well, I thought, why not? And I'd say, well, have you worked in a restaurant before? Never. Well, have you cooked before? Well, I mean, at home. It's the pros now. It's the pros who are brewing. It's the pros who are cooking in the kitchens. It's people with experience in opening and running restaurants and breweries. You guys, what are your final thoughts on that? Or anything? Can you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> sort of my kind of where we are now, what's, connect, what's happening next is that part of where we are headed is that the pros are really taking over with beer and food in Richmond? Um, I, you know, I've been living in Richmond uh, roughly since 2005 and eh, kind of 2002. Um, it's been amazing to see the revitalization of the city. I've been waiting for it for like 10 years because I believed in this place for a long time and it wasn't always in the best shape, um, but I've watched it grow and grow in between um, the number of really craft restaurants um, the number of breweries that are popping up in Richmond. Um, I, I think it's really only, only a matter of time before we become a pretty big deal. Um, you look at a place like Asheville, North Carolina, uh, which is very, very well known for, I, I think they have 11 or 12 breweries, if not more than that, in their general area. Um, and they haven't even hit saturation with the amount of businesses that are there. I think there's only more room for growth for us. Um, I see really, really great things for the city. Um, I agree. Uh, I grew up in, in Tampa, Florida, and um, moving up here and living here, um, you go from only chain restaurants to to independently owned great restaurants. Um, it's unbelievable, and I don't think people in different areas of the country even realize 
that there are different options out there and where you can live. And, and now I, you know, you get a sense in, in Richmond that you're, you know, there's not beer snobs, but they're, they're Richmond beer snobs and, and Richmond food snobs. They're only going to eat what comes out of Richmond or what's brewed in Richmond. And, and it's a pretty cool atmosphere to be in because more and more people keep joining on it. And it's just this huge force where you see, you know, probably different restaurant chains trying to come in or, or different national breweries trying to come in and, and it works for about a month, and you don't see them anymore because people want the local stuff, and, it, and, it, and it's just a great, great town to be in for that. God, I don't know to add. Um, you know, Richmond's awesome. It's on the cusp of something that's even better, hopefully. Um, and it's a lot, I mean, to see this many people listen to us talk about food and beer, that's pretty weird. Um, <laughs> awesome. Sorry, awesome, but a little weird, you know? Um, so as that continues to grow, it's going to be better for us. And somebody mentioned before about the saturation point. Um, seeing this many people interested in hearing us talk during a lunch hour lets me know that there is potential for that much more growth and that much more quality. And, you know, I just hope I can keep up with everybody else who's so talented and awesome. So, uh, I think um, just being, uh, being up here and being asked to be up here, one, is amazing. And to be amongst these people and everyone else out there, and that you guys are just as excited about it as we are. And you guys are going to drive it just as much as we are. And I think that's, that should be the overall goal is that all for one, right? I don't I have much to add, but thank you, everyone, for coming out and continuing to support local businesses. All that money goes back into the community. And <laughs> for us, pretty much immediately. So... You know, it really is a big deal. Great local shops, great local restaurants, awesome breweries. I mean, that would be it for me. I just want to say thank you guys for your patronage, your bottoms up for 22 years, and we'll keep delivering to the Churchill. <laughs> I lived there for four or five years myself at one point, and that's it. And I thank you guys for having us all up here for that, this discussion, and um, thank you. We owe you a round of applause for bringing the food. Thank you for uh, being the groundswell. And maybe uh, somewhere in the next 50 public squares, we'll get you back and we'll have a different perspective. Carrie, Jacob, thank you very much for leading a very provocative conversation. Um, food for thought, ladies and gentlemen, no pun intended. Thank you very much. This closes down the second public square with three more to go. Next up at 1.30. Virginia's ban on same-sex marriages. Thank you very much. Come up and talk to the restaurateurs and craftsmen. <laughs>